I'm delighted to be given the opportunity to contribute to your conference on education policy support for children's education in the Highland Plateau of China. I want to share some ideas on how policy for education and lifelong learning needs to evolve to support distant sustainable futures for individuals, communities, societies and the planet. I'd like to start with the moral purpose of education. According to Professor Michael Fullen, the moral purpose of education is to make a positive difference to people to enable them to develop the potential they have to lead fulfilled and productive lives. It's this concern to contribute to the development of others that motivates people to become a teacher. Underlying my presentation is the belief that we have reached a point in human history where the moral purpose of education and the commitment to learning throughout life needs to be broadened to encompass making a positive difference to the health and vitality of the planet that sustains all life. I will argue that policymakers in all spheres need to adopt a new ecological worldview within which to construct policy, a view that I think is consistent with what the UN policies for sustainable development are trying to achieve. My own scholarly interests are in higher education and everyday learning, but I believe that educational policy has to be fully integrated across all stages of life. We tend to think of education and learning throughout life as separate things, but we need to think in the way that Edward Lindemann did 100 years ago, when he said, the whole of life is learning and education can have no endings. Policy support for education should be fully integrated into policy support for a lifetime of learning. We call this lifelong learning, I believe that working towards sustainable futures requires us to make the life-wide dimension of lifelong learning explicit, as this is the dimension in which we act and affect the world. The young students of today are likely to live well into the next century, and the education they receive today must provide the foundation for 100 years or more of learning to adapt to a world that is in continuous formation, a world that will be profoundly different to the world we know today. These are the core challenges for educational policymakers and practitioners who are concerned about the distant rather than the near future. We've reached a turning point in the history of human civilization where a new concern is emerging that will need to be addressed by educational leaders, policymakers and practitioners, namely the concern that over the coming decades, we will need to learn attitudes, values, and behaviors that will help sustain and regenerate the health of our planet and the ecosystems it supports. This is a new and significant context for education and learning, a context that is framed by the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and UNESCO's Futures of Education Initiative. We are ecological beings enacting life within and with an ecological world of relationships and interdependencies. We inhabit a world in continuous formation, but we are an integral part of its formation and not separate from it. We are, if we are to succeed in the project called learning for a future that is sustainable for all living things, we need a paradigm of learning, education and action and achievement that embraces consciously and fully the life-wide dimensions of everyday life and its fundamentally ecological character. The educational thinking underpinning my talk is published in three books and a white paper. Education policies and practices across much of the Western world are influenced by neoliberal thinking in the service of a social market economy. They are focused on the present and near future, preparing people for the world of work they will enter when they leave full-time education. They are characterized by prescriptive curricula based on a predictive outcomes-based model of learning and assessment, school and teacher accountability, and market-like competition between schools. There is an underlying assumption that by equipping students with the knowledge and skills to perform in the present, they will automatically be able to adapt to and cope with new situations in the future. But for the first time in human history, we are approaching a future that will be fundamentally different from our present. According to Daniel Suskin, the pathway to the future involves increasingly rapid introductions of new technologies, ever expanding information flows, decreasing shelf life of knowledge, 
more automation and less work for most people. People will increasingly need to coexist with intelligent machines and AI, and humans themselves are likely to be part machines and incorporate AI, posing profound questions on what it means to be human and profound questions for how we equip young people today for undertaking this journey. I think there are two challenges uh, facing us when we think about learning for a distant future. The first challenge uh, is framed by a question like, how do we sustain uh, and regenerate ourselves for a lifetime of learning in a world that's in continuous formation, recognizing that we are active participants in its formation. We drew this picture on the wall of our center at the University of Surrey to remind ourselves that the world of learning outside the educational institution is messy. It's full of ambiguity, uncertainty, and conflict requiring negotiation and resolution. In this world, knowledge is contextual, situational, experiential, partial, tacit, and often embodied in the practice and behaviors of people. But formal education encourages learners to only appreciate learning through an academic perspective, a way that is fairly linear, logical, and unproblematic, that mostly comes from listening to authorities, reading texts, answering questions through essays, and generally complying with the rules of the institutional system of learning and behaving. More than this, institutions create stable, safe, low-risk environments for learning, which are structured and which encourage and support and where the information needed to learn is already codified in books, articles, and easy to access lectures and PowerPoint presentations. In the world outside education, there are, there are usually no textbook answers to a situated problem involving unique people in unique circumstances. In fact, there may be no clear cut answers, only partial answers that must be implemented and adapted to fit the context in an experimental way. It's all far removed from the predictive outcomes-based learning we find in formal education. And we need to develop learning experiences and practices that require these forms of learning. The future of the young people today will not replicate what it's been in the past. And enabling learners to prepare themselves for such a future poses enormous challenge for educators and policy makers. Professor Ron Barnett says that education focused on the present is formed around knowledge and skill-based curricula, whereas future-oriented education engages uncertainty and fluidity. His argument provides a philosophical foundation for the idea of a pedagogy for future learning, and the idea that lifelong learning is a never-ending process of becoming. The challenge of learning for the future requires us to develop the values, attitudes, and capabilities necessary to learn in any context and situation, and to be resilient, particularly when things do not go as we had planned. But there's no point in learning for a distant future if we can't sustain that future. So the first challenge is nested within a second challenge that can be framed by a question like, how do we learn for a sustainable distant future? Many decades of scientific research have shown that human behaviors have not only reshaped our world to make it more hospitable for more humans, but in doing so, we've, had, we've, we've caused a serious detrimental impact on planetary resources and systems that sustain all forms of life. It's only a matter of time before we cause irreversible damage. The second universal challenge focuses attention on learning and unlearning, how individually and collectively we can live a life that minimizes damage to our environment and wherever possible, act in ways that will help regenerate the world so that humankind has a future. This great challenge of sustaining our future has the characteristics and qualities of a wicked problem as, the, as defined by Rittle and Weber. It comprises a multitude of complex interrelated problems that are difficult to solve because of incomplete contradictory and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. There are no right and wrong answers, only many possibilities, and the many stakeholders involved have different perspectives, conflicting priorities, and partial solutions. 
The vast scale complexity and multifaceted nature of the problem requires the whole of humanity to be involved in tackling it. And we all have a responsibility to make our own contributions to solving it. So what do we need to think about when we develop new policy and practice for sustainable futures? I want to con briefly consider four general themes. The first is how we develop understanding of what sustainable development and sustainable futures mean. And I think this is especially important at the level of the individual and how the individuals will apply it in their own contexts. Secondly, I believe that we need to develop an ecological view of living, learning and achieving and a more useful concept of lifelong learning by making the lifelike dimension of learning more explicit. Thirdly, we need to be able to build the capacity of the system to learn and develop, and this should be a collaborative process. And fourthly, we need to be able to experiment and use these ideas to develop understanding of how we support education and lifelong learning for sustainable futures. The United Nations is the world's global strategic thinker and planner when it comes to sustainable development and provides leadership in policymaking. The wicked problem of humanity's future survival is framed by the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which offers 17 sustainable development goals and 169 associated targets. Education has its own goal, SDG number four, and it's to, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality of education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. This SDG gives education two new roles. Firstly, to raise awareness of the problem of the sustainable development and encourage behaviors that will support the achievement of SDGs across whole societies. So clearly education is seen as the key building block to enable the world to learn and understand what sustainable development means and then provide, provide the platform for applying this knowledge. Uh, but the second important role is for lifelong learning to enable individuals and societies to keep on learning how to sustain themselves and regenerate their world. And education and individuals' own lifelong learning must be connected and integrated. But learning for a sustainable future will only work if we develop and own our own goals to guide our everyday behaviors. The sustainable development goals and related actions are directed at governments, NGOs, large corporations and global agencies. So it's not easy for individuals to understand how they might use them to guide their actions in their everyday lives. The United Nations recognizes this and its 10 year sustainable lifestyles and education program in collaboration with Futera developed these good life goals. These goals can and should be customized by individuals to guide their choices and behaviors in their everyday life in ways that are consistent with the high level SDGs. But there's merit in organizations, educational institutions and communities devising their own set of good life goals that speak to their own cultural settings and ways of life. And I'll return to this, these goals towards the end of my talk. UNESCO's Institute for Lifelong Learning is the body tasked with developing ideas and perspectives to aid policymakers and providing resources to support practitioners. This is the first place to go for information resources about education and lifelong learning for sustainable futures. In 2019, UNESCO published a framework for the implementation of education for sustainable development. And it stated that ESD in action is basically citizenship in action. It invokes the lifelong learning perspective taking place not only at school, but also outside the school environment throughout life of each individual. ESD in action requires a new perspective on the roles and functions of schools. The Education for Sustain Sustainable Development Roadmap was a report published in 2020. It defines five priority areas for member states to support and implement ESD. They are urged to firstly integrate ESD in global, regional, national, local policies 
related to education and sustainable development, promote whole institution approaches to ASD, help educators develop the knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes needed for the transition to sustainability, recognize and engage young people as key actors in addressing sustainability challenges, and engage communities as they are as these are the places where meaningful transformative actions are most likely to occur. The report argues that ESD aims to do three things, raise the awareness of the 17 goals in educational settings, promote critical and contextualized understanding of the SDGs, and mobilize action towards the achievement of the SDGs. Another report, Embracing a Culture of Lifelong Learning, was also published in 2020. It argued that sustainable development cannot be achieved without a culture within which people are committed to lifelong learning. Furthermore, lifelong learning must be the governing principle for education policy. Education is clearly seen as the means to transform societies underpinned by a culture of learning throughout the whole of life. The recognition that the role of education in the, in the Sustainable Futures project is not just about learning in school, but is also about applying learning in the world outside of school, connects education with personal action in the life-wide dimension of lifelong learning. UNESCO's Institute for Lifelong Learning commissions foresight studies to imagine what the future might look like. One of these working papers opens a new way of thinking about our place in an ecological world. And I'd like to quote a passage from this. By 20, 2050, we have, the fully, fully, we have fully acknowledged that humans are embedded within ecosystems and that we are ecological, not just social beings. We have dissolved the boundaries between the natural and the social sciences and all curricula and pedagogies are now firmly grounded in an ecological consciousness. I think this is a very important um, vision of what a future education system might be like. So I'd like to explore the implications for learning practice and education of this ecological worldview. It recognizes that we live in an ecological, relational and interdependent world and all organisms, including humans, exist within ecosystems. A natural ecosystem comprises the complex set of relationships and interactions among the residents, the resources and the habitats of an area for the purpose of living. And a very good example there is shown in the slide of a coral, of a coral reef. But the main difference between us and other organisms is that we change our natural environment in profound ways and build entirely new environments so that they are more hospitable to what we want to do and achieve. We inhabit different eco-social systems which comprise the complex set of relationships and interactions among the humans, resources and habits of an environment for the purpose of not only living but doing many other things. And this teacher, for example, inhabits an eco-social system called a primary school uh, and a primary classroom and within primary education. And we, we can therefore imagine how she might um, interact ecologically. And I'll turn to that in a few minutes. A world in formation in which everything is connected and interdependent lends itself to the idea of ecosystems as a description of the dynamic environment in which people, technology, and the material and non-material world coexist and interact. The idea of ecosocial systems forces us to think of the whole system in which people live and work, form relationships, and interact in order to achieve the things they value and access the flows of information and resources that are essential to, to learning, doing, and achieving. A human ecosystem is a specialized social cultural structure embedded in the natural world created for a particular purpose. The slide shows several examples on the right-hand side of people doing things in different ecosocial systems. These human created environments contain specialized places and spaces, rich in materials, tools, and technologies to support the practices that are undertaken by people with specialized knowledge and skills to achieve particular things deemed to be valuable to society. 
While the doings are important, the most important feature of these eco-social systems that makes them quite different from other natural systems is they are sites for the making and remaking of meaning. Our eco-social systems are the environments in which we learn and achieve. There's a lot of interest in the idea of educational and learning ecosystems amongst thought leaders and policymakers. In their Global Education Futures report published in 2017, Lukshar and others promote the idea of educational ecosystems for, for societal transformation. They define an educational ecosystem as a dynamically evolving and interconnected network of educational spaces with individual and institutional providers that offer a variety of learning experiences to individual and collective learners across the learning life cycle. In 2019, WISE published a report on local learning ecosystems with particular emphasis on emergent models. And in 2020, the organization launched its own learning ecosystems living lab. This aims to mobilize practitioners, experts, policymakers, and innovators, and create a global community of practice and thought leadership to support the design of key components of learning ecosystems in different regional contexts. We might illustrate the principle of an ecosystem using higher education. The ecosystem is represented in this figure as a nested structure with three levels, global, national, local, and this uh, could also be the shape of uh, a primary or a secondary education system. At the local level, a university ecosystem is designed to encourage and support learning. It includes physical spaces such as classrooms, lecture theatres, laboratories, computer rooms, and specialist rooms like dance studios and music rehearsal rooms, and virtual spaces to enable people to interact. There are also libraries and learning resource centers and informal social, sp social spaces such as cafes and even outside public spaces where people can meet and talk informally. These spaces are just one part of a complex social cultural material environment, which includes tools and other materials necessary for learning and rules that govern behavior and practice and policies and procedures, and regulations and administrative frameworks and most importantly, a culture which determines the way we do things here and what is expected of people within this environment. At the national level, the ecosystem contains other higher education institutions and agencies that regulate, help develop or provide services or information to the system. It also contains professional bodies and learned societies and the organizations that employ graduates, all of which may interact with the university and its many parts. At the global level, there are infinite possibilities for learning and collaboration. This level has changed beyond all recognition in the last 20 years through the growth of the internet, the rapid expansion of internet platforms, all providing services to learners, mobile technologies, and the ubiquitous internet access. It is the interactions between providers and learners and other agents that open up the many possibilities for entirely new educational learning systems that Lukshar and others draw attention to as they look to the future. But to talk about ecosystems in education without considering the ecology of practices within the ecosystem is a serious omission. So the question I've been trying to address in the last few years is can we develop ecological theories of learning and practice that can be integrated into this ecological view of the world. When we engage in professional practice, such as a teacher engages in every day, we place ourselves in the practical and conceptual territory of learning through the experience of doing something in order to achieve something that is professionally valuable. Learning through the experience of doing connects us to the great educational theorist, John Dewey. For Dewey, Doing and the experience that emerges from doing is always a dynamic two-way process. He referred to this process as a transaction. He said, when we experience something, we act upon it. We do something. Then we suffer or undergo the consequences. 
We do something to the thing, and then it does something to us in return. The consequence of our doing is that it changes us. He used the term undergoing to reflect the dynamic nature of the change that accompanies interaction, but undergoing also equates with learning. Anthropologist Tim Ingold reinforces Jewish transactional ideas and tells us that we should not think of ourselves and our environments as separate things. We are individual, indivisible, bound together through an ecology of life and of living and experiencing developing through our experiences of the world. He says, organism plus environment should not denote a compound of two things, but one indivisible totality. This totality is not a bounded entity, but a process in real time, a process that is of growth or development. So when we interact with the world, we, our interactions are causing us to change and grow and develop through that process. And this way of perceiving ourselves in the world is core to the ecological worldview within which learning and education can be understood. So what does this theoretical model look like if we apply it to a teacher in her classroom? And this is a lovely, I think a lovely image of a teacher full of joy, engaging with children who are also full of joy and fully engaged in a very rich classroom environment. So what happens then if we superimpose Dewey's model of experiential learning onto this situation? Well, firstly, we have to recognize that that teacher is there because she's undergone. She'd had a lifetime of learning and experiences, but in particular, she has trained to be a teacher. She's undertaken uh, the disciplinary training, the development of knowledge and skills and attitudes and behaviors that allow her to come into this environment and manipulate it, use it, get the most out of this environment as she interacts with her children uh, through her teaching activities. And the environment here is a, is a physical space, as you can see, rich in resources, but with children who are fully engaged. So what is she doing when she comes into that environment? She's firstly perceiving it. Through her senses, she's gathering in the information flows. She will already have done some planning in advance, so she knows how she's going to approach it. So the teacher perceives her environment, and she makes sense of the situation. From her learned repertoire of actions, she, let, she selects the actions that are most likely to engage her students. She, she tries these actions out and she gains uh, feedback as the students respond to those actions and she monitors the situation. She's able to learn through the action of doing the effects of her actions on the children. And where necessary, she then adjusts those actions she changes them. So it's a dynamic, her relationship is dynamic interaction with that environment. After the class, she critically reflects on her experiences and she gains maybe deeper insights into what worked and maybe what didn't work so well in that classroom situation. And that learning, that deeper learning then is available uh, for future interactions. And this pattern, uh, conforms to what Michael Eru called an epistemology of, pra epistemology of practice. A professional uh, encounters in a new environment, they assess the situation, they decide what to do, they act on that plan, they monitor the effects of their actions and adjust if necessary, and they reflect on the whole experience, gaining deeper insights into uh, the situation. But I want to dig a little bit deeper into the nature of this interaction. Um, and uh, by studying the nature of the interactions, we can create a map of the dynamic world the teacher is inhabiting and influencing and gain insights into the way she interacts with her environment, her eco-social system. I'm calling this set of relationships and interactions an ecology of practice. So let's quickly go through this map then. Her ecology of practice has a past her own life experiences, and particularly those experiences that have enabled her to undergo and become a teacher. 
the knowledge and skills she brings to the situation is the result of her past undergoing. Her ecology of practice has a present as it unfolds in her classroom as she, as she causes or interacts with each new situation. And in her new, near future, she is likely to reflect on her experiences and learn from them. And in a more distant future, she will draw on these experiences again when she learns and plans for a new situation. The teacher's um, uh, thinking and actions are shaped by many things. Firstly, she's embedded in a number of contexts. For example, the ethos and culture of the school, the various policies that affect what and how she teaches and the particular educational context of what she's trying to achieve. Secondly, as she takes in the information flows from her environment, she can perceive affordances, opportunities for action as the children participate in the activities she has created. She won't anticipate all these possibilities. They will emerge in the course of interaction and she will have to respond to them. There are abundant resources in this environment to stimulate and support learning. But the most important resource is the teacher herself with everything she brings to the situation and the children and everything they bring to the situation. So remember, they also have a past. They also have a past. They also have experiences that they can share in any learning situation. They inhabit a physical space, but the teacher also creates cognitive, psychological, emotional, and playful spaces for interaction and learning. Everyone and everything in this environment is related, and these relationships are used and developed through the particular activities that are orchestrated and facilitated by the teacher. Activities that are intended to cause interactions that will lead to learning. The components of this ecology for practice in which the intentional outcome is learning and development are woven together by the teacher in a part deliberate and part opportunistic act. The idea of an ecology of practice is one of weaving, weaving where the individual connects up and relates these things that I've been talking about. The teacher is creator, but she only comes to understand the effects of her ecology as it unfolds. And so she monitors the effects and adjusts her actions where it's appropriate. Through her actions, the tools she uses, the feedback she gains through her senses, the teacher extends her mind and body into this environment so that she becomes indivisible with it and the ecology she is creating. It's what uh, Tim, uh, Tim um, Ingold said before about the indivisibility of individuals as they immerse themselves in a very interactive way with their environment. Within the ecology, meanings are shared and co-created and the totality of the experiences enable both the teacher and the children to undergo. So from this simple example of practice, we can devise a tool or heuristic that we can use to examine and inter interpret any practice within which learning emerges. This heuristic provides the foundation for an ecological perspective on learning and practice. The ecological perspective on learning shows us that we are fundamental, fundamentally ecological beings thinking and acting in an ecological, relational, and interdependent manner. And our very existence depends on this. Understanding this relationship between us and our actions, our environments, and our learning and achievements puts us in a better position to understand how we might contribute to a sustainable future. I'd now like to turn more specifically to the matter of policy support for education and lifelong learning for sustainable futures. While education can do much to develop knowledge, understanding and empathy for a world that needs our concerted and deliberate action to sustain and regenerate it, edu education alone cannot achieve this goal. The recognition that education and learning for sustain sustainable development is a whole of life commitment and practice means that any policy that's focused only on formal education will not deliver a more sustainable regenerative world. We need policies that integrate and support education and lifelong learning for sustainable futures. The UNESCO vision for a sustainable future highlights the important role of lifelong learning. And I'll quote from this report, this 2050 vision is of a world that has undergone a deep cultural shift based on a strong awareness 
of the innate potential of learning, a continuous learning ethos pervading all spheres of life, learning for oneself, for others, and for the planet. It plays a key role in driving sustainability. However, in order to achieve this cultural shift, we need an enhanced vision of lifelong learning that values learning as a life-wide, every part of life at any point in life, lifelong, every point in time along the journey of life, enterprise in every aspect of life. It's a vision and a culture that reaches beyond the SDG uh, goal number four to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all to Edward Lindemann's idea that the whole of life is learning Therefore, education can have no endings. Changing behavioral patterns to secure a sustainable future will only happen if people act in ways that are consistent with this goal in the everyday situations and activities that make up their lives. This is not explicit in the traditional concept of lifelong learning. And for this reason, I argue that the life-wide dimension of lifelong learning needs to be made explicit. We need to talk about lifelong life-wide learning. The concept of life-wide learning provides the most comprehensive and inclusive framework within which we can understand learning, personal development and action. Because of this, life-wide learning provides the foundation for a better understanding of the nature of lifelong learning. The life-wide dimension contains all the circumstances of our current life and determines who we are and who we are becoming. It is in this dimension of our life that we make changes, we change, develop our behaviors through the choices we make, which is why this dimension of living and learning is so important to the idea of sustainable futures. These ideas, clear, these ideas clearly locate learning and development in particular contexts and situations in our lives. The concept is dominated by situational experiential learning and incorporates all forms of formal, non-formal and informal learning. But it's our capacity to reflect on experiences and create narratives from which we are able to extract new meaning that enables us to integrate and apply our learning to other situations in future. Crucially important is the adoption of an ecological worldview that fully acknowledges that humans are, like all other organisms, embedded within ecosystems, and that we are ecological, not just social beings, and that everything we do and the phenomenon associated with our doings like learning and creativity and other achievements are profoundly ecological in nature. Perhaps this way of seeing ourselves in the world will deepen our understandings of our, impact, of our impacts on it and help us sustain our future. And I think if we can introduce these sorts of ideas into education, it will go a long way in providing a foundation for um, learning for sustainable future. Every education system needs its thought leaders and capacity and agency for leading and developing educational thinking, practice and policy. In the context of this presentation, I offer the Singapore National Institute of Education as an example of a system level thought leader with capacity and agency to bring about change and support the training and development of teachers. This institution is responsible for overseeing the training, development and accreditation of teachers. Their work is underpinned by a philosophy shown on the right hand side of this slide that embraces the life wide dimensions of learning. It's accessible publications like the, this working paper on the left provide an excellent resource to stimulate thinking about the way education and learning need to evolve to achieve sustainable futures. And I'm going to quote from this working paper called Future Ready Learners Working Paper, which states, education success must be measured beyond typical achievement standards. The three purposes and outcomes of education are, one, developing learning, in brackets, knowledge, two, developing life work, in brackets, vocation, and three, developing living, in brackets, citizenry, values, and sustainability that enable individuals to live peacefully and collegially with one another in society. Clearly sustainability is clearly linked there to the idea of citizenry and values.
This project is all about learning at every scale and contextualizing and applying learning in our own unique situations. There are lots of resources available for thought leaders, policymakers, and educators. A Google search will reveal hundreds of sites. And I've just picked out three good examples of sites which provide good, reliable uh, material. The UNESCO Sustainable Development and UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning are important sites for thought leaders and policymakers. They host a continuous stream of publications, um, a blog, which provides lots of different perspectives and online events and lots of other resources. For teachers, I think the world's largest lesson has abundant multicultural resources and it includes lesson plans and some resources in Chinese. And then to learn more about sustainability, the Gaia Education is the leading authority on education for sustainability. And it's aimed at people who want to engage or are leading their own sustainability projects. It offers a 120 hour, eight module online course and a design experience where you can apply your own learning to your own project with the support of experts. Um, and it's an excellent, it's an excellent site. There's a great need for experimentation. We can, we can learn through our own experiments. Policy for education and learning for sustainable futures needs to encourage exp exp experimentation at all scales and in all contexts. And we need to share the learning from such experiments. A decade ago, I led an experiment at the University of Surrey in the United Kingdom to develop and apply the concept of lifewide learning to a higher education environment. The experiment demonstrated that it was possible to adopt a more comprehensive and holistic view of learning, development and achievement and expand the concept of curriculum so that it encompasses the whole of a learner's life. The results are described in my book, Learning for a Complex World, a lifewide concept of learning, education and achievement. The experiment was undertaken before the sustainable development goals were published, but it could have been adapted to incorporate these goals and running this experiment again would certainly do that. I'd like to conclude by mentioning an experiment we're undertaking in October and November. It takes the form of an open collaborative inquiry where participants will undertake to identify one or more um, sustainable development goals and interpret them in the context of their own life. And over four weeks, we want to encourage participants to change some aspects of their behavior and create a story about their own process of learning for a more sustainable future. And in this way, we should end up with lots of stories about this process of transformation that individuals will have to take on this journey towards a more sustainable future. So let me try and uh, bring together a few conclusions um, that are what, what, might, what this might mean for education, policy support for education and lifelong learning in the Highland Plateau of China. Firstly, there's no escape from the wicked problem of sustaining our future as a species. Children of today will be confronted by the same distant future of a radically different world that will happen in their lifetime. We have reached a point in human history where the moral purpose of education and a commitment to learning throughout life needs to be broadened to encompass the health and vitality of the planet in order to develop UNESCO's vision of a continuous learning ethos pervading all spheres of life, learning for oneself, for others, and for the planet. Two, the fully immersive, uh, uh, to fully immerse ourselves in the challenge of sustainable futures, Thought leaders, policymakers, and educators must embrace an ecological worldview within which learning, along with all other human activities and phenomena, can be, uh, can be viewed as ecological. Related, connected, interdependent, and arising from our interactions with the environment. At the same time, lifewide learning should be explicitly recognized within the overall paradigm of lifelong learning, since this dimension contains the everyday activities within which people are able to develop and achieve a more sustainable future. I do believe that we should use the term lifelong, life-wide learning to make this explicit. Three, policymakers have a responsibility to devise policies that will support education and encourage lifelong learning for sustainable futures. We need integrated, not separate policies 
that are connected to other social policies within which sustainable development is prominent. Four, there is merit in devoting time and resources to participating in international projects and initiatives concerned with sustainable development and sustainable futures and related educational and learning innovations to access emergent thinking and ideas and contribute to the global development of understanding. Five, there is merit in encouraging educational practitioners and policymakers to form local communities for thinking and action to develop strategies that are meaningful, relevant, adapted to and effective in the local environment. Six, there is wisdom in encouraging and supporting experimentation at all levels, scales and contexts. Schools, colleges, universities, regions and wider communities which they are, uh, within which these are embedded. There is wisdom in collaboration to facilitate the sharing of results and in, of the learning. Through such experiments and their evaluations, policy to support education and lifelong learning will be more effective. Seven, there is wisdom in incorporating emerging ideas and understanding into the education and training programs of new teachers and the continuous professional development of experienced teachers in order to develop the capacity of the education system to engage effectively with the need for sustainable futures. And number eight, it's necessary to develop resources to support teachers in their important work to facilitate learning for sustainable futures. While there are abundant available resources provided by such organizations as UNESCO, it's important to develop resources that are useful, relevant, and meaningful in local contexts. I'd like to conclude by inviting conference participants to join our global community at LifeWide Education, in which we share practices and ideas and experiences related to LifeWide learning and currently learning for sustainable futures. On the bottom of this slide in red, you will see the URL to a web page on this website uh, where you can download uh, my slides and also um, the narrative that goes behind my slides with lots of links to resources. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to present these ideas and I hope there is something useful in them. Thank you very much.